Hey, Granska with the Horse Barn Management Show, um, put on by Pro Barn Management. And um, if you're joining us, hop on over here and check it out. We have a packed hour. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about um, horse barn management and what that looks like going into summer. Um, because at least at our place, and I know a lot of other places that I've been to um, for consulting, um, there's a lot of changes that happen in the summer and sometimes a lot of headaches um, dealing with certain changes you make and sometimes clients aren't happy. So I want to talk about that tonight. If you have questions, ask and we are going to try to talk about it, um, answer your questions and um, tell us where you're from. Um, we've had people from all over, from Australia, from Canada watching so if you are watching let us know where you're from we'd like to say hi and thank you everybody here in our country america for um watching and uh so tonight i already i had a couple questions this week that i wanted to um answer real quick and then we're gonna dive right into summer stuff oh and before i forget shoot i know i sound like a broken record on this but it's really important if you're just joining us for the very first time or you've seen me advertise it and you quite you weren't sure quite what it was um june 12th and 13th i'm having a two-day barn management workshop here at my barn vinland stables in nina wisconsin the flyer is on pro barn management it's also on facebook on pro barn management or you can go to probarnmanagement.com and um, we have a great group already signed up we're taking a few more people if you're interested i always keep it kind of small um, because it's so packed both days and there's just so much information and we talk about so much um, it's definitely worth your time and your money my husband and i'll be sharing with you everything um, from boarding horses in a small number large number of financials what that looks like cost versus revenue how to set up your chores um, we're gonna listen about your business talk to you tell you some of the pros and cons and work it through and you're going to be talking with lots of other barn managers barn owners people that are building people that are already in it and um, trying to change things so if you're not doing anything register for it um, we will feed you really good both days um, you'll get my book a step-by-step -step guide um, to starting and running a successful horse sporting business you will get this book plus so much paperwork um, you're gonna go home with a whole bag of stuff um, information I want to set you up so that you um, have a super great strong foundation in running your horse sporting business and so that you're not losing money because um, compared to what a lot of people will say out there, you can do this as a business if you set it up right. I know there are the people out there that will say, no, you can't, but I'm going to say, yes, you can if you do it right. And you can do it as a business. You should never be losing money boarding horses. You should be making money. That's, that's what making money is what having a business is. <laughs> you don't board horses to lose money. You board horses to make money. So, um, if you're interested please register we can still take a few more people and we'd love to have you join us for the weekend we have a question we have a question already already okay dive on in okay do you have lesson horses you use that are owned by someone else if so do you charge them board or is their board free in exchange for using horse for lessons okay um so i'm not a trainer I'm uh, I own the facility and um, I, I I'm the barn manager <laughs> I run it so I personally my horses are not lesson horses I have had other people in the barn that their horses have been used for lesson horses and that is between them and the horse trainer the only thing I do is if a trainer is making money off lessons from a horse that's boarded here and people are coming to our barn to take lessons then I get um, I get so much a lesson now you can do a percentage you can do a flat-out rate um, I always I've always done five dollars a lesson so if they use that horse and um, the horse does two lessons in one day I would get ten dollars um, per each ride so I do it like that. Some people, some barns will charge a percentage. 
but um, as far as an exchange for board, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't do exchanges for anything, and that's something I've always kind of preached about. Um, bartering always ends up where someone feels like um, they're getting the short end of the stick. Um, and I feel the best way to do it, um, if I was going to use my horse as a lesson horse, um, is they would pay me to use my horse. Um, I wouldn't do an exchange for board. Now, it sounds like you might be the trainer. And if you are, let me know. If you're the trainer and you're going to use people's horses for lessons, you can definitely set it up however you want. But you really want to make sure you have a contract in place for things like if the horse um, is lame, um, if something happens to the horse, um, gets hurt under your instruction. Um, but I have always found it easier. Yes, she's a trainer. Okay, you're a trainer. So the trainers that have been here at our barn, and we've had quite a few over the years, um, when they use a lesson horse, a border. Train, trainer and barn owner. Trainer and barn owner. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's a great one. We're going to talk about that one night because it's a great combination um, because it's, it's set up a little differently when you are the trainer and the barn owner. Um, so... You can definitely use people's horses if they want to do it, and you can work it out however you want if you want to barter um, for that. What I would make sure of is that you have your care, custody, and control insurance uh, for the horses in your care, and also make sure you talk with your insurance agent about the insurance for that for using lesson horses. Make sure you're covered on your end just in case something happens. Um, a horse bucks someone off or a horse trips and falls and then the horse gets hurt and the owner of the horse wants to come back and tell you that you're responsible for that. Also having your contract who's responsible for farrier shots, you know, what about um, if the horse all of a sudden it becomes sore and needs chiropractic or stuff like that. So get all that uh, organized and um, in order definitely talk to your insurance agent to make sure you have the right coverage when you're using lesson horses. And care, custody, and control is part of that. They will um, they'll ask you all those questions according to what you're using the horses for. So um, I hope that helps. Uh, that's a great question. I love to talk to trainers who are also running the barn. Um, I give you a lot of credit. It's a lot of work. Um, I'm exhausted <laughs> running my barn. I can't imagine being a trainer and giving lessons on top of it. So you're doing it all and that's fantastic because um, it's a lot of work to be the trainer and to run the barn. And so, um, uh, well done. I mean, she did add this. Um, she's, she's covered, mm -hmm. but she is trying to figure out how to cover board when I am solely using a horse for lessons. So I don't know if that changes anything for you. You know, I'm not sure I quite understand. I'm not sure quite how if I understand exactly what you're saying, but if you're using a horse completely and they're letting you use the horse, um, you know, I would check to see, you know, maybe what other people are doing. The person here that used the horse, uh, used, uh, the trainers, I should say, that used horses here at our barn, what they did is, I know a couple horses, they paid them so much a month to use the horse and did a regular rental of the horse. Um, bartering, I've, I have seen bartering um, a couple times between a trainer and a boarder here. And one time a few years ago, it got a little bit, uh, I, it got complicated because the trainer ended up using the horse more than they were supposed to use the horse and the boarder felt the horse was being too used too much and then when the boarder wanted to come out and ride their horse they couldn't so you can set it up however you want however you want just make sure you have it really detailed in writing so that they don't get upset and come back and say this 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 and um, everybody is on the up and up and you can do it however you want um, i've seen it done both ways and um, I think as long as there's a good agreement between both parties, it can be done. Um, bartering, I've just never been a big fan of bartering um, because it seems like that's a real gray area and things seem to get kind of twisted. And 
Um, you know, like if you're bartering $150 off the board and they feel that the horse is being used more than $150 worth of time, there might be some stress between you and that border. And that's why a flat rate agreed upon ahead of time with designated times being used is much easier. So I hope that's clear. I hope that helps you. Um, great. Okay. We have something else. Okay. Totally different. Let it rip. Okay, let's see. It says, hello from the San Antonio area. Hi. Please, please tell us about all of your fly abatement methods. Fly abatement? You're talking flies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm having that. I'm assuming yes. flies, flies, yes. flies. <laughs> great. Well, that's a great way because we're going into summer. So we're going to talk about summer and we're going to talk about flies. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll have to be honest with you. One thing, we're kind of lucky the location we're at here because we're really open. It's open farmland. There's no woods by us, and there's it's always windy here. It seems like there's always a breeze. That really helps. Um, when we first um, opened up, I had read. Um, have you ever heard of fly predators? Um, and you you know you order them, they come in a shipment, and you put them in all the little stalls, and they hatch, and they're supposed to eat the flies. It's <laughs> <Trish's laughs> just me. <laughs> Because she's wow. making her face at me. I know, it's real, <laughs> it's lovely. And they're supposed to work. Um, you know, I did it two years in a row, and to be honest with you, I don't notice a difference from when we did it years ago to where we are now. It really helps because our stalls are cleaned really early in the morning, and we're done by like 9 o'clock. So the stalls are fresh, the horses are outside, there's no manure in the barn. Um, unless you have a horse that's in for, um, you know, a lameness issue or the farrier. But, um, and our barn is really open. If you're in Texas, I'm assuming your place is really open too because of all the heat. Um, and um, because we always have, um, it's always windy here kind of. Um, we seem, it just doesn't seem to be too bad in our barn. We have fans in our barn. We have ceiling fans that blow. That helps. Um now I'm going to talk a little bit about flies and fly spray and I know some people watching this um, probably um, they're gonna their chin is gonna drop and they're gonna go what <laughs> because and some people won't agree with me and that's okay you can do you know that's what's great about the show you don't have to agree with me um, as far as fly sprays um, for our borders um, this time of year, I do not fly spray any horses on our property. And um, I never have, um, except my own. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't want to fly spray 40 horses. It's a lot of fly spray, it's a lot of chemicals, and I don't want them on me. And you're, it's just a lot of chemicals that I would be doing all the time. So I don't fly spray and the people here know it. And if someone was not going to come here because of that, that's their choice if they don't want to come here. But I've ne I don't think I've ever had anyone say, well, I'm not coming there because of uh, we don't fly spray horses. I have to be honest with you though, because we clean our stalls so early in the morning, we just don't have a fly problem. When we get the horses outside in their paddocks, my husband uh, takes a skid loader. He keeps them pretty clean. We just, we have flies, but not a lot. Like people will walk in our barn and they'll be surprised that there's just not a lot of flies, but we don't have any kind of foods out, perishable foods anywhere in the barn. They have to be in the refrigerator, in the lounge, um, apples, carrots, and stuff like that. Um, all fly sprays have to be in buckets so that if they spill, um, it goes in the bucket, not on our tack room floor. And um, we have fans going on. We just don't have a problem with it. And it's it's not, I don't know, I think it's probably a combination of the barn, the way the barn is set up. Um, so, for example, today I just opened all our arena doors, and we have three huge double doors, and I just got them open this morning. And they stay open the entire summer. And then we have 
three openings in our aisle way of double doors and then two more going into the aisle way. so our barn is completely open all over the place there's a lot of airflow through there so i think that helps um if you have a fly issue you can try fly predators um, and see how that works i just we just have not used it in years but we did try it at the beginning so i hope that answers your question on flies i don't do fly spray um that's just my own personal thing um there might be someone in her barn that asks someone else to do fly spray for them and that's fine and um they can do that but i just don't do it because i don't want to have to fly spray 40 horses and um breathe in all that stuff so um that's a little bit on the flies Another question. Another question? Okay. <laughs> Let her in. We're just going crazy. Good. Another question. Mm -hmm. Oh, same person. Do you personally administer wormer to all of your boarders' horses, or do you require the boarders to provide proof of some type? If you do it personally, what do you do with the difficult horses? Okay. So, um, I give our boarders an option, and we just did worming um, in April. And April and October, everybody has to deworm. Everybody has to deworm their horse. Not one horse gets left behind on that. Um, if our boarders choose to do a fecal count, um, now I'm talking about for the state of Wisconsin, you might want to check your state and what the vets are recommending where your state is and what the protocol is, because I think it can change from state to state a little bit. But the good news is, is that they're saying, the equine vets are saying all over, you know, that we don't have to deworm every other month like it used to be years ago. So if someone does a fecal count and their horse is a low shedder, then um, they only have to be dewormed twice a year in the spring, April, and in November. If the horse is a moderate shedder, then they have to be dewormed like in July. If the horse um, is a high shedder, then it's four times a year. And if someone chooses not to get a fecal, which is perfectly fine, um, and a lot of people don't, then the horses have to be done four times a year because it is a boarding stable and we have horses coming and going and we want to keep up on it. So the way I do it is this October, I mean, not this October, this April, I, let, I sent out an email to everybody and I told them the type of warmer I was going to buy. And if anybody wanted to purchase it for me, I gave them the cost of what it would cost and I would have the wormer for them in a bag hanging on their um, little hook by their saddle um, with their name on it and if they wanted me to deworm their horse for them I would I have a book where everybody has to fill it out and they have to leave the tube the tube that I just purchased and uh, the box right there and then I check everything I do have a few people that ask me to worm for them deworm their horses for them and probably like 10 horses in our barn I do and um, it goes really fast and I just take care of it and it's done now for difficult horses um, I have had a couple through the years that were really challenging and um, sometimes I have to put a chain over the nose to do that and to wake up the horse a little bit to get them but um, I'll be honest with you, I have had one horse that was really difficult years ago, very, very, very difficult. And the problem was is the horse would um, charge you, kind of go at you when you were trying to worm them and they would rear up and it just was dangerous. So then I twitched them to do it. And I just did it really quick, got it in really quick, untwitched them, it was done. So um, that's how I do it. Um, if someone needs help, I'll help them, and um, I try to create an atmosphere that if someone wants to learn how to do it, um, I'll teach them how to do it so they can do it on their own, um, and hopefully their horses are easy. Um, but I keep things really um, simple, and um, everything is charted, and it works really well. So that's how I do it. Okay. And another Good. question. Okay. It's crazy. Okay. Hi from Ohio. Mm. How do you Hi, Ohio. <laughs> how do you handle it if a horse has ulcers, for example, mm -hmm. and the vet requests an extra grain meal, let's say lunch, and you only feed morning and evening? 
The boarders at my barn pay for their grain, but I wanted to know your thoughts. So, um, if you have a horse um, with ulcers, and, well, I'll be honest with you, I haven't heard of a horse with ulcers having grain as an additional. Usually, um, we had a horse in our barn um, that was having kind of colic signs for years, and they finally scoped the horse and um, found ulcers. And what we did is put a hay bag in their stall, and that really made a difference. Um, the way I always tell people is if you have to do anything above what you're going to do over and above for your what you offer for board. So if you normally offer two feedings, AM and PM, and now the vet has prescribed that this horse needs to have a, a second or third meal somewhere in there, whether it's grain like you were saying or whether it's um, hay, whatever it is, um, soaked grain, that is a special service. And if, if that happened at my barn, then I would talk to the owner of the horse. I would first in my mind think, okay, what am I going to charge for this? And they would get a surcharge that I would, you know, that they would get every month. Um, so, for instance, if I have to give medication in the middle of the day, um, let's say, like I'll give a medication in the AM or the PM because I'm doing the grain anyways and I don't charge for that. But if I have to give a horse something in the middle of the day, like at 12 noon, the horse has to have a med, um, I'm going to charge them for it. So if I have to do a third feeding in the middle of the day, that's either going to mean you have to do it or your employees are going to have to do it. Someone has to do it. It's time is money. It takes time. It's money, whether you're paying someone or yourself. And so you want to have a special uh, services sheet and you want to have all your special services on there. And then at the very bottom, you want to have uh, to be determined for special services that come up that you've never had, because I guarantee you, the longer you board horses, all of a sudden you're going to get asked to do something that you've never had been asked to do before. <laughs> you're going to go, oh, I don't know what to charge for that. And so then you have to think it through and think, do I want to charge this amount or that amount? You might need to ask around. But I would definitely charge uh, if I had to feed a horse. See, our horses here are in herds. So that meant that if I have to feed that horse grain that is vet prescribed grain for the ulcers midday, I have to walk out there and I have to grab the horse and pull the horse out because I'm not going to stand there and, you know, depending on how long the horse eats, you know, 15 minutes or so, while all the other horses are standing there like vultures <laughs> looking down. And I'm like, look at him, like, don't come closer. You know, mm -hmm. it's just a hassle. So what I would end up doing is walking the horse up, put the horse in their stall, have them eat their grain and walk them out. That is all time consuming. And before you know it, 30 minutes have gone by, maybe even longer. It's really time consuming. Well, if you multiply 30 minutes times even even 30 minutes minimum, if you multiply that times uh, seven days, then you multiply that, uh, multiply that times a month. That's a lot of hours that you have put in. 14, 14 hours? Mm -hmm. Four, Trish said 14 hours. It's 14 hours. <laughs> You're good at that. <laughs> and that's a lot of time right there. So if you're paying an employee $12, $13 an hour, you know, for that, and they have to do that. How much is that? I don't know. I didn't do that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a couple hundred dollars. Something. I don't know. So you have to always look at it. It's a business. Time is money. So if you're doing it yourself, and you know what the thing is, there are going to be days that you don't want to walk out there and have to get that horse and feed him the grain. So you should be compensated for it. So that's how I look at it. Oh, Trish said $182. If it was $13. Yeah, <laughs> if you're paying yourself. So it's just something to think about. Always look at it from a financial aspect. Um, and that's part of the business. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question on that. Okay. We're going to go on. Okay, we're going to talk about some summer stuff. I didn't know if there was another one there. Okay. We're going to talk about some other summer stuff that I want you to think about. Um, 
The big thing that um, happens in the summer um, right away are the fly mask and um, the fly sheets. And are you going to charge for that or are you going to put them on for free? So when we first opened 16 years ago, I was nervous that I was going to have like 40 fly masks to put on. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be a nightmare. And you know what? Over the years, it's never been. Um, I've already started putting two on this year. And usually I end up with like three or four people that have me put a fly mask on. Um, I don't charge for it anymore. I did years ago. I did charge for a while. And I just said, no, I'm not going to charge for the fly mask. I can handle this. Um, it's not a big deal. As long as the fly mask fits correctly, um, which as a barn owner, you're going to see some interesting fly masks. And honestly, you're going to find people, if they're new horse owners, sometimes they'll buy one. Um, I had this happen to me twice over the years where someone went and purchased a fly mask. And when they went to put it on, it was too small for the horse's head, but they didn't realize it was too small for the horse's head. So now it's pushing in on the horse's eyes. And I can't stand that. So I had told them they need to get a different one. They can't use that one. And then I'll recommend some because I've seen a lot of them and some of them are just awesome. And then some of them I would not put on a horse. So I don't charge for fly mask. And as long as it's um, in good working order, if it gets muddy, uh, or the Velcro gets all goopy, whatever, um, then that is, they have to clean it. Now, we do have, um, and if you have geldings, you know how they like to play and roughhouse. It seems like people will put fly, want fly masks on their horses, and it's always the geldings. They start pulling them off of each other. And that happened today, in fact. I had one, I went out there, and the fly mask is out in the dirt. And it's because they start playing with each other and they think the fly mask is something fun to play with. So I always tell people, they'll say, well, how do you deal with the customers, your clients, if they get upset because the horses won't leave the fly mask on? And I always tell people, you need to tell them ahead of time that if the horse doesn't keep it on, that is no one else's fault. It's not another horse's fault. That is part of the horses. And they can decide if they want private turnout so they don't have to worry about that or they're just going to have to live with it. Um, it's I'm not going to start switching horses around to other herds because, you know, these two boys like to play so much that they see the fly mask and they end up shredding it. Because I've had I've gone out there and seen fly masks just tore apart and the Velcro's torn off. And then you have to call the owner and sometimes they're not happy. <laughs> But that is part of having horses, and they need to understand that going into it. And so I want you to be very direct and very clear and say, you know, when someone comes for a tour and you talk, and they ask about that kind of stuff, you need to tell them this is, you have a gelding. It's, I say geldings because usually it doesn't happen with mares very often, but it happens with geldings a lot. And they think it's like a big toy. They can pull it off, and then you see them running around, dragging it all around and playing tug of war with it. So not all horses do it, but once in a while, some of those youngsters will especially. So you wanna just share that with the horse owner and just say, I am not gonna be switching things if they don't keep it on, that is on them. Um, now, fly sheets for summer. Um, I do charge for fly sheets to put them on and off. Once in a while, I'll have someone just leave theirs on all the time so the horse will go outside in the fly sheet it'll come in and it stays on in the barn and it works out fine too but if they want me to pull the fly sheet every day and then put it back on when it goes back out then I charge for that so it's something you want to think about um, as far as um, those kind of services with those two things because a lot of people deal with fly masks during the summer and um, you know, also another thing to think about, too, is um, I know you're going to probably think I sound kind of, I don't think I'm cold or hard, but after a while it gets kind of tiring. When our horses are out on pasture and they're way out there, if the horses pull a fly mask off another horse, like two boys pull a fly mask off, I may once go out to try to find it. If it happens again, I call the owner and they have to go look for their fly mask. 
and it's just something I'm not going to go look for it constantly. And it could come to a time where I say, you know what, I'm not putting it on anymore because they don't keep it on anyways. As the barn owner, you get to call the shots and you always run a risk. Are they going to leave because they don't like what you've, uh, the new mandate you've made, you know, the new uh, rule you've made. And you know, are you gonna, how are you gonna do that? And I've just come to the point where, you know, I can, I'll do something once or twice, but after that, if it's gonna keep going on, then I have to decide if I'm gonna do it anymore. And fly masks are those, those kind of little boogers that a lot of horses don't leave them on. And I'm not gonna be traipsing all over the fields <laughs> looking for them. So it's just something to think about. Okay, any questions? Yep, we're good. Okay, another thing that I wanted to talk about um, in the summer is uh, turnout, hot weather, and storms. Because if you're boarding horses, you're going to be asked, how do you do turnout with really extreme hot weather, and how do you handle storms? And the thing is, it depends where you live in the in the country you know because we're in Wisconsin but if you live in other places like Arizona you might have lean-to's you know that the horses can get under we don't have shelters for our paddocks for our horses in our big barn so most of the summer they go out every day weather permitting if it's raining but it's warm they'll go out um, the only time we've ever brought them in early is for here if all of a sudden it starts getting up you know in the 90s and the heat index is really high how does that work where the heat index is like a hundred and, and, and hotter, yeah, yeah and it's awful and there's no wind like it's just dead our barn is actually cooler so a lot of times we'll get them out early in the morning and then we'll bring them in around noon they got to go out and they're actually happy to come in because they don't have shelter out there. And that's the way we're set up. If you have pastures and paddocks and you have shelters in them, then you have another option. And that is the horses can get in the lean-tos. They can get in the run-ins, but we're not set up that way. So sometimes if it's extremely hot, which thank goodness it's not here that often, but once in a while we'll get a couple days where it's really hot like that. Someone will say, do you bring them in early? And we do here, we bring them in around noon. And that way they've gotten out all morning and then they come in there and then they just sleep in the barn because it's so cool. So that's how we do that. Um, storms. Now I had a lady years ago who, um, she was on a tour and she asked me, well, what do you do if a huge storm comes up? Will you be able to get all the horses in? And I kind of, <laughs> I kind of laughed at her because I have a lot of horses here. And, you know, the reality is my husband and I watch the weather. And if we see that a bad storm is coming in where it could, you know, either be hail related, you know, have hail or um, hopefully no tornadoes, but it looks like it's going to be a bad storm. Thunder and lightning and we know it's going to be bad. And we'll get the horses in early and to beat the storm. But there are some times that storms pop up so fast, there is no way I can get the horses in. And you know, you try your best, but the, the fact of the matter is, even sometimes with radar, you just don't know how it's going to pop up. And the horses, you know, they do fine. They The rain doesn't bother them. It's just, you know, you think about the lightning and the thunder, but I'm not going to risk myself going out there trying to grab them. And they're running around like nuts anyways. There's no, you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. So I just let them out there. They get wet, the storm passes, and then, you know, usually they're fine. You really want to explain this to your boarders and make sure they understand this because you need to get them to understand that in a perfect world, wouldn't it be nice if you could beat every storm, but sometimes you just can't. And there have been lots of times that we're getting horses in and I'm soaked getting them in because I didn't get them in in time. Um, but you want to have them understand the horses are going to be fine. And, you know, unless a tornado is ripping through, they're, they're probably going to be just fine. And there's not much you can do. You can't 
sometimes you can't outrun the storms and the horses get a little nuts and if they're going to be upset about that and they are always going to worry about that then you need to sit and think is are they a right person for your barn because i just don't get too worried about that and if they're going to be panicking every time and calling you and texting you there's a big storm coming in are you bringing my horses in you know you have to think do you want that kind of client and i've just gotten to the point where i feel like i need people to trust me but I can't control the weather all the time, especially in the summer when the, red, uh, the weather can be really erratic. So you might want to think about that and how you're going to talk to your clients about that so you get them on the same page for storms because it's kind of important. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question. Okay. Do you continue to store the blankets during the warm months? Do you clean them for the borders and charge them for it? I'm asking oh. my boarders to take mm -hmm. them home and wash them for next season, but they haven't yet. Great question, and it's on my paper. <laughs> okay, I just sent an email out to all the boarders, um, actually yesterday morning, and um, all winter blankets have to be off the property by May 31st. They all have to be gone, fall, winter, spring blankets, um, because a lot of people will bring out fly sheets and stuff like that. So they all have to be gone. We do not store them here. Um, we have a rule here that any time a blanket has been on a horse, once it's been on a horse once, it cannot go in the tap room at all until it's been completely washed. So those blankets are hanging on blanket bars on each stall or in the back part of our barn, we have these um, other blanket bars that swing out and they're hanging back there. So the thing is, this is the truth, the reality. If you don't give people a date on when you want the blankets gone by, those blankets will sit there all summer. <laughs> they will sit there and they will stink. So I have learned to be very direct and give people a date. And if I see blankets still hanging, and let's say it's two days out till the end of the month i'll just shoot them a friendly text and say hey don't forget you need to have your blankets gone by the end of the month i always give them a date you do better to give them an exact date than to say have your blankets gone in two weeks it's two weeks is too gray and too just two weeks to someone means two months <laughs> some people say oh two weeks i got two months no give them a date and say may 31st they have to be gone by May 31st, and that's just part of it. They can do what they want with them. They can put them in their trailer. I don't care. They cannot have them in the barn at all because they'll just stink, and they'll get moldy, and they'll just get gross. Now, we, do, I don't, we don't have a washing machine on our site, but I have been to barns that do, and they let people wash their blankets there, and then they charge them. Um, I thought about it years ago about doing something like that, but boy, the wear and tear and everything, I don't know if you'd actually make money because the washing machine, it's a lot of wear and tear on the washing machine, and that means there's maintenance. You'd have to charge a lot. There are companies that will come and pick up the blankets. Um, there's one in Green Bay that comes down, and it'll pick up the blankets and then bring them back like a month later, all clean, looking brand new in bags and stuff. And then you can also take yours places. Um, I just don't do any of that. My own horse's blankets, I have to wash myself. So I wash them myself. And, um, but yep, the rule is everybody has to have theirs gone by May 31st. And um, no exceptions. You just have to, and, and you know, sometimes when I'm writing emails out to people, and it's something like that, I put no exceptions in capital letters. It's just, I want to just let them know I'm not fooling around. And I have no problem reminding people. And it's not, I try to be nice about it, but they're only looking at their one horse. And I'm dealing with almost 40 horses. And it's a lot of stuff all over. And winter blankets get really gross. So just be direct make an email out post it also post it in your barn somewhere so they see it a um, couple places and then you might have to send a reminder to if you have someone that's chronically late on certain things um, I do on a lot of things I have you know one or two people that might be chronically late and I just shoot them a text and say don't forget tomorrow's a deadline it has to be gone and it's gone so I hope that helps okay 
Um, moving on to summer also, um, some of the things that um, you're going to want to think about uh, for summer is, especially for someone who's new, uh, maybe newer into boarding horses and hasn't, haven't done this for a while, um, you're going to want to really think about your setup for storing grain because I know here at our place and um, any place that it gets really hot and humid, the grain isn't going to last as long and if you have your grain anywhere where it's going to, where it could get, um, like if you have a storm that rolls in, it's really windy and some of the rain kind of blows into the building. If it gets on the grain bags, even though the grain, you would think it's waterproof, it does create a moisture and we've had grain turn rancid. So you want to make sure that you're turning your grain over your bags of grain over more frequently and not you know don't store like a hundred grains bag <laughs> of grain because um you know it's just go through it faster because you don't want it to go bad um and i also tell my boarders the same thing because some of them don't know and they'll get a good deal they'll go get grain and they'll think it'll be a really good deal and they'll buy a ton of it and i'll say well you know what I don't know if this is a good idea to have it all here. You might want to take some home because our barn isn't heated. I mean, it's not um, heated in the winter and it's just, it's the temperature of what it is outside. So if it's humid, you know, the grain is going to get humid. So just think about that when you're setting up your barn. Um, the other thing is when you are, this is kind of, for some people, you may not have pasture to turn your horses out on. But if you're going to be turning your horses out on any kind of grass, and this is the time of year when you're going to do it, some of the biggest obstacles that a barn manager has to deal with are uh, introducing horses to pasture. And what do you do for the people who um, don't want their horses on grass or the horses have metabolic issues and you have to put a grazing muzzle on for summer? You want to think about these things um, because you're going to want to think about if you're going to charge a special service if you have to put a grazing muzzle on when the horses go out on grass. You're going to want to think about um, introducing horses. Um, I saw someone was talking about it today on Facebook, you know, what time frame, how do you do it, how do you get some of the horses in that don't come in. You want to really think about your setup so that it's easy to get those horses in off the grass fast enough. I know for us, the first couple, um, like the first week probably, um, it takes two of us, me and my husband, um, where he has to go down to one end of the pasture and get them going. And then once they get into the dry lot, I have to close the gate because they don't want to leave, especially when they've only been out there for 15 or 20 minutes. It's just awful. <laughs> they do not want to leave. So the first couple weeks are always a little bit, um, that transition into summer with pasture is a little bit hard. And the other thing is you're going to have, this is something client related. You're going to always have di people's different opinions on how long horses should be on grass. And you're going to have people that feel that the horses should be out there all day. You're going to have people that um, don't want their horses out there that long. You might have someone that wants you to not put their horse out at all on the grass. But the thing is you have to remember however you do your pasture management, it's going to cost you money in the long run. And so you want to think of that ahead of time because eventually those pastures get eaten down. You're going to have to think about reseeding them. There's a lot of upkeep. We mow ours every summer once it gets starts to get a little weedy. And um, so right now it's growing in. And then like in August, we'll just mow it all down, get rid of the weeds, get rid of everything that costs fuel and um, wear and tear on our tractors because there's a lot to do on that. And it's time consuming. If I do it or David, we still, it's something we could be doing something else. Um, if we have to pay someone to do it, that's money. Um, that we have to pay them. So you want to think of that, all those expenses um, that happen with summer because pasture management, um, in order to keep your pastures going strong, it, it does take a lot of work and um, there's expense to it. And you want to make sure when you're figuring out your board prices that you're figuring in money to put away for stuff like that because 
if you have to reseed your pastures and rotate horses, rotate fields, you know, it could be a thousand dollars. So just think of that when you're um, setting up your place and you're putting you're putting money away every month for that kind of stuff. So I hope that answers your question there. Okay. So this question came in and um, it's a, I, it's a great topic. It says, please mention some of the reasons you have asked a boarder to leave your stable. I am having a very hard time deciding when it's time with a difficult boarder. Um, I don't want to be too hard on my clients. And, oh, wow. So they want to know, uh, they want me to share some of the reasons that I've asked someone to leave and when do you know it's time. And you know, I'll be honest, it's a learning curve for everybody and uh, what you can tolerate and what you won't tolerate and I'll give you my thoughts on it. And everybody, it's a little different for everybody. Um, it's definitely something, it's to this day, if I know I'm going to have to ask someone to leave, it's never easy. It's gotten easier. Um, I can read it ahead of time now. I see the writing on the wall. I see the storm clouds brewing. You know, I know it's coming where I wouldn't over the first couple years. And so it's something that you have to learn. And um, you're going to make mistakes when you do it. I'll be honest. I made a few mistakes. And um, there's, there's a right way to ask someone to leave. And there's definitely a wrong way. And I'll share with you a wrong way. Um, but to tell you reasons that I've had to ask a boarder to leave, the, this is how naive I was when we opened our business and what I thought. I always thought the reason that I would have to ask anybody to leave when we first were building was because they couldn't pay the board. That was the reason I thought that I, I, I couldn't see beyond that. I couldn't see all the problems that were brewing out there that I would be dealing with over the years to come. It turned out that's never the case. It's never about the board money. It's always about uh, personality problems, drama, um, not following the rules, um, could be stealing, you know, it could be a lot of other heavy duty stuff, but it's never been um, because of not paying the board. Um, it's several times it's been because they came to our barn. I was very open with what we did and how we did it. And they started off loving it. And then about a year into it, they all of a sudden are questioning everything and they don't like how we do things or they don't trust us. And you get to a point where it's time to say goodbye. You can feel when the relationship starts to dissolve and starts to fall apart. And they'll ask you certain questions. I think one of the big red flags is, uh, you know things aren't right, is if a boarder comes up to you and says, can I have a copy of my boarding contract? And then you know, oh, something's not right. They're checking something out to see, you know, usually it's what kind of notice they have to give if they're going to leave. So some of the reasons I've had to ask someone to leave usually were personality conflicts, um, they um, were creating a lot of drama in the barn, and when I talked to them, they kept on. They were um, undermining my uh, credibility as far as the care for the horses and starting to create this uh, atmosphere where people are starting to question how I took care of the horses. Um, those are big, and they're very stressful, and they're very real, and it happens. And it's like, to me, a toxic cancer. And, you know, when you're first getting into boarding horses, you almost don't even believe it's happening. And you don't want to believe it's happened because you take such good care and you work so hard. And then you have someone undermining you and talking behind your back or saying this. And you start to think, wait a minute. And it's, it's hard to navigate all that emotionally. And it's very stressful. Now, years later you kind of toughen up just naturally you toughen up as a businesswoman a businessman and you just learn to ride with it and you learn to say you know what i'm not dealing with this and you that's when you start to say you know what i think it's time we have a talk 
And usually when we have a talk, we just know it's not going to go well. And that's when I tell them that I don't think the barn is a good fit for them anymore and it's time for them to um, look for another facility and I'll give them a 30-day notice. Now, the biggest mistake I made years ago, and it was when I was brand new, and I always tell people don't do this, is um, I had to give a 30-day notice to someone and um, in our barn. And it was a trainer and I was too nervous to talk to her in person so I wrote up a letter and I left it in a stall pouch for her to see and then my husband and I took our girls and we went to the Dells <laughs> for the weekend and we just like left town. Now you gotta remember this is like 15 years ago, 14 years ago, and this is, well, like 14 years ago, and really social media, I wasn't even on social media. I don't know, was there social media back then? No, I don't know. Not and, you know, this whole cell phone yeah. thing, I didn't text back then. So I left for the weekend and had someone take care of everything. But see, the problem is when you do that, when I came back, I came back to just a nightmare. Everybody was upset. You know, because this person had had time to get everyone fueled up. So now I'm putting out fires all over the place. So I always tell people, I guarantee you, if you're going to board horses, there's probably going to come a time when you have to ask someone to leave. You want to give them a paper copy of the 30-day notice. You want to talk to them in person and just say, I'm giving you a 30-day notice. And no matter what, if they get ugly, just walk away. You've given it to them. Go up to the house, take, you know, just get away from it. Don't get in an argument with them. It's just not even worth your time and just, you have to just cut it loose. Um, I try to not get to that point and try to talk to people ahead of time, but sometimes you can't change people. They've already made up their mind. They already know what they're going to do and they're just, they're egging things on and, the longer they stay at the barn, the more they create an atmosphere where they get everybody riled up. So if I could tell you anything, um, you're going to learn to be direct. You're going to make mistakes because I did. You're going to do it once and say, oh, that didn't go along very well. I should have said this or I should have written this. Learn from those mistakes, grow from them, and it'll get easier. And, you know, you're going to want to cry I think I think most people they feel like tearing up because you feel like you're working your butt off to take care of these horses and they're coming at you and just picking you apart or saying things behind your back and it hurts and you have to just realize it's business and you just need to cut those people you don't need that toxic kind of person in your barn you work too hard too many every day of the year do too much for the horses in your care and so don't let anyone treat you like that no matter what you should never be disrespected in your own barn so don't let it happen if you have to give a 30-day notice um, and you maybe need a little guidance find a mentor to talk it through have someone read your um, your letter to make sure it's written correctly and um, also above all else make sure you have an attorney um, that you can always go to in case things go south I've had to contact mine a couple times when things have gone south because someone got mad at me because I asked them to leave um, so it can cost you money but make sure you have an attorney in case things don't go right and Another thing, too, that I learned about five years ago, um, we had to change our boarding contract, is I have where I can give someone a 30-day notice, but I actually also have where I can give someone a seven-day notice. Because if they're on your property and things are turning really bad and going really south, 30 days is a long time to wait that out. It's horrible and you don't want to go there. So I actually have the ability to get someone off the property within seven days. I could have made it shorter, but I felt comfortable with seven days. Um, normally, through the years when I've had asked someone to leave, usually if I ask them to leave, they leave right away because they want to move on. They want to go to their new barn, and sometimes they're embarrassed. Not that I tried to embarrass them, but it's just the way it is. It's just awkward. But once in a while, you get someone with a strong personality, and to have someone there for 30 days is really tough. So if your contract doesn't have that, you might want to check into that just to protect yourself in case things really go south. Um, it's super important.
Okay, Trish, I don't even know what time it is. It is 7.24. Wow. Okay, we're flying tonight. If you have any questions, ask real quick because we only have a few minutes left. And, okay, I want to talk about a couple more things. Going into summertime, people, if you have a barn where people are going trail riding or they're going to horse shows, you really want to have a detailed, um, and you want to be very intentional. You want to have a list of what the protocol is for going to horse shows, going on trail rides, um, and getting hay. Are you going to let them take hay? Are you going to charge for your hay if they're going to take it somewhere? I, I don't charge. I let them take it. It's the honor system as long as they don't waste it. I feel they've already paid board. They can take the hay. I do understand that they're going to feed their horses more at a horse show because you want to keep the horses content in their stall. Totally get that, and I'm okay with that. Um, so you need to figure that out because people are going to ask. Um, the same with going on a trail ride. If they're gone for a week, you know, they're going to need to take hay. You want to figure that all out. Um, people coming and going on your property, you want to... Um, do you want to be notified ahead of time if they're coming or if they're going to be leaving at four, and, 4 in the morning? Um, we like to be notified. So if someone's, like we have a bunch of horses going to a show this Saturday. And so there's a good chance a few of them will be leaving about 5 in the morning to leave for the show. Um, I just want them to tell me ahead of time the day before, hey, we're leaving tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., because then I know, okay, there's people here, the lights will be on, you know, why is there people here? Because we're pretty firm on our barn hours, so I don't want people here unless I know. The same with coming home. I've had people come home at 3 in the morning from a show from out of state, and they'll just text me the day before and say, gosh, I think we'll get around 2 or 3 in the morning. And I'll say, no problem, just put your horses away, I'll have the stall cleaned, um, and just make sure the lights are out when you leave. You're going to want to talk about this and get this organized because it's frustrating when you have people coming and going at your barn and you don't know what's happening and they're grabbing this and they're grabbing grain um, you know you want to really be intentional so that you are on top of what's happening it can go really smooth when you have everybody on the same page but summertime is kind of crazy and you have a lot of horses coming and going especially all over the place so just think about that it's important um, someone had asked me, do we allow people to take bedding? And I don't. I don't allow people to take any bedding at all. I used to, when we first opened, I let people put bedding in their trailers. And then I learned really quick that how I bed a horse trailer and how they bed were two different things. <laughs> and they were taking a lot of bedding, putting it in my horse trailer, in their horse trailer. And then when they came back, there might be one pile of poop. And they were throwing all the bedding out in the manure pile. And it was like throwing money away. I decided I'm done with that. So I don't do any of that. They have to get their own bags of bedding and do all that. So you want to think about that because that's some of the stuff that happens during the summer. And um, I think summertime, depending on where you live. So here it's super quick condensed because we have such a long winter. So everything is magnified for like three months. And it's just like, whoa, and it comes at you really fast and hard. But if you live in a place where the weather is warm a lot longer, then a lot of these things you want to have in place, but it won't seem so intense all at once. And you'll kind of ease into it. So just think of that going into summer. Um, if you have any questions at all after this and you want to ask or talk to me, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, I think that is about it. We're done for now. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and just remember, you can watch these and listen to them anytime. They'll be on probarnmanagement.com, on YouTube, on Facebook. And if you're not doing anything and you're still interested, you know, check out the workshop on June 12th and 13th. It will really open your eyes to a lot of stuff and uh, will help you get through Anything, even if you're designing your barn, you, you, you know, it'll really give you an eyeful of how to set it up so that you don't get burned out and it's efficient. And uh, I just want to wish you a wonderful week. And um, I think that's it. We're signing off, right? Yeah. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. And thanks for joining us. And thanks for the awesome questions. Bye.